President Holland's uh, thinly veiled reference uh, to our experience together in England uh, will have alerted a few of you who know that he was learning to be a missionary while I was learning to be a mission president. Uh, he succeeded well. I've been sent back a couple of times to try it over. <laughs> and uh, I've been very proud of him. Pat and I were hoping he'd make it, and he did. His observation about spring weather made me say under my breath, it's more sprung than spring this morning. And I thought of you and uh, that you certainly could not be called summer soldiers or sunshine patriots. I congratulate you on whatever it took uh, to motivate you to be here and say that I believe it's a good thing. I believe for the first time just now I put into words uh, for Sister Holland and President Balaf uh, something that has been in the back of my head and on the top of my heart and bothering me, I think, a little, and that is a certain uh, lack of enthusiasm for opportunities to speak in the last uh, several months. I assess that, and I repeat for the first time, said it out loud. I think that's because in Asia, in those special experiences that had more to do with life and the spirit and the gospel than utterance, and particularly in the temple where, not to my surprise, but to my eternal gratitude, I had an opportunity to talk freely and comfortably in the most sacred of settings and cannot and do not since feel quite the same. Perhaps I shall. But in those precincts there is a spirit and there are realities of uh, spiritual relationships that do not border on the spectacular but have to do with those constant uh, sensitivities and kindnesses and the graciousness and goodness that express the very best in us. Well, I'm happy to be with you. I confess I couldn't uh, refrain from drafting an elegant speech for you this morning, but I think I shall be able to resist reading it, or most of it, though I will try to make reference uh, to some good literature as a kind of a theme, including uh, some allusion to to the greatest of literature. What I want to say is what I would wish my children to hear or have heard or my grandchildren to hear when they are ready to come. It matters what we say and how we say it. One cannot be cavalier about 30 minutes or 20 of anybody's time. I have thought with a smile to myself, uh, about one story, maybe President Holland doesn't know that I know. It's, it's the story of an old sea captain dreaded for his uh, puritanistic approach. He disapproved of almost everything, including his first mate. So when the first mate came back one night slightly inebriated, the captain entered into the day's log. This day, the first mate returned to the ship drunk. The first mate resented that, but there was nothing he could do about it. However, his day came, he was officer of the watch, and the captain was ashore. He came back that night, the first mate entered into the log. This date, the captain returned to the ship sober. <clears throat> now, uh, it matters how and what we say. Speaking of grandchildren, I was approached this weekend conference by a sweet older lady who told me she was 90. That relieved me a little because I was expecting her to say, as I do regularly hear older people say now, I've been listening to you and enjoying you since I was a little girl. <laughs> uh, that thought shatters me, uh, and in some cases may be true. As long as BYU keeps uh, replaying old tapes, 
uh, senescence will not really be available for observation. Eternal youth is perpetuated by replaying speeches given here so many years ago. I haven't the slightest idea what I said, and I don't listen to them, frankly, when they're played. Now, one other person approached me at the conference and said, we used to love to hear you speak about your children. Why don't you start speaking about your grandchildren? I will indulge her and myself and enjoin you in one simple report about a grandchild or two grandchildren. Our eldest daughter and her husband and five children came to live with us for a few months because they suffered the misfortune of having their house catch on fire and while it was being repaired, stayed with us. So for those several months, we had the marvelous blessing of getting to know them a whole lot better. So much better that what may be the only major triumph of my life occurred at four o'clock in the morning. One morning when a little boy came not to his mother or father or grandmother, but to me, awakened me and said to Grandpa, I flowed up. Uh, somehow that had become apparent to me already. I went with him to the bedroom where he and his little brother had been sleeping and saw with marvel and amazement that this kid has the most significant propulsive capacity I have ever known. <laughs> After I had completely evacuated the room and all parts thereof, reclothed two little boys who were kind of staggering around after they had had a shower, and gone back to my own room marveling. Uh, after all that occurred, uh, I lay chuckling. That was a great experience, full of good cheer and some laughing and some fun. Several days passed. Then at the breakfast table one morning, uh, the boy who'd been involved, a little older boy just starting school, who had given his thanks and hugs, was sitting by his younger brother, the littler person who was still struggling with rudiments of the language. It was the latter who spoke between mouths full of cereal. He said, Grandpa, I think you are the greatest man in the whole world. I said, well, maybe not the greatest. Mark's certainly one of the best looking, but <laughs> maybe not the greatest. But he didn't laugh. He said, and the goodest. Do you know that somehow that little fellow, uh, I think because of the experience and the good cheer involved, came to feel something that he may, if he's lucky through a lifetime, have amplified a little more. That in serving and being served, you really do learn to love each other, both she or he who serves and they who are served. I commend that to you, the good cheer and the sense of delight in being able to help someone who really <laughs> needs help, and they did. There are a lot of people who need help, and Mark, the masterful philosopher, got out of that experience something very important. He related it a little over enthusiastically to one involved, but the principle is real and good. Let me share with you what I read in a recent edition of the Sporting News. It was a note written by the mother of Steve Howe. You may know that he was a Major League Baseball pitcher of tremendous skill and affluence and future who is out of baseball because of cocaine. His mother had something to say, and it was printed in the Sporting News and reprinted in Sunday's paper. It is easy to place blame, she said, where there is no blame. We have five children, and we have one cocaine addict. I would die for my children, but I will not take the blame for Steve's addiction any more than his father should. You know what I think Steve's problem is? Everything he ever said he wanted to do, he's done. He's an ordinary kid who got everything he wanted. 
everything he ever wished for, all his dreams came true. And it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. Oh, I admire Mrs. Howe's understanding of the principle of agency and her scripture-like attribution of responsibility where responsibility is due. I know nothing of these individuals and make only this comment. I cannot help wondering what Steve wished for and dreamed of in his quiet hours. I doubt he dreamed of being a drug addict who lost permanently major opportunities because of that addiction. I doubt he ever really dreamed or wished to be in the position he's in. Does anyone ever really aim for failure or for self-destruction or the vitiation of potential? Again, I certainly do not judge or write off Steve Howe. I hope he comes back in lots of wonderful ways. But I simply emphasize what a wise man once said, he who picks up one end of a stick picks up the other. He who chooses the beginning of a road chooses the place it leads to. And I will add another wise line, that not failure but low aim is crime. I cannot fail to wonder whether anybody ever opened to Steve a sense of what can be because of who he is and who he belongs to and what is in him as potential and power and capacity. I wonder if he ever dreamed of really being of the kind of service I've watched many, perhaps some sitting among you today, give in the barrios or the refugee camps of Asia. Such a dream would be worthy of his manhood and his capacity. It's a good thing, I think, if you're capable of being a major league anything, but there are some major league objectives that are more important than baseball or basketball or any other sport. Dreams and wishes and desires matter, but they do not themselves take us to achievement. What we really want to accomplish, to do, to have, to be, will be accomplished on the basis of our day-by-day effort and the dream coming true will be the consequence of our putting to work the capacities we have to take advantage of the opportunities around us while they are yet there. Scriptures have many marvelous examples of this, but for today let me take a theme from great literature, the theme of a young hero who had some ambitions, a dream, a desire which may be stimulating or enhancing to some of you. I hope so. In Tennyson's Idols of the King, in that segment of the poem headed The Round Table, you know about that, is the story of Gareth and Lynette. Gareth was the last tall son of Lot and Belisolent, says the poem, a prince much loved by his mother and protected by her from the fate she feared, which was to be like his father close to death and his brothers who were at the round table but for whom she felt less confidence than this lad. Gareth desired to be a knight. He had other dreams I'll mention. His mother wanted him to stay at home and enjoy the estates and the opportunities of the influential and wealthy. She wanted him, she said, to follow the deer, he answered. Oh, mother, how can you keep me tethered to you? Shame, man am I grown, a man's work must I do. Follow the deer, follow the Christ, the King. Live pure, speak true. Right, wrong, follow the king, else wherefore born. Gareth, through trials and tests, 
demonstrated his faithfulness and his competence and courage in pursuit of those worthy dreams. He defined, in effect, not only whom he wanted to follow, but how he understood that path and where it led and what it required. Live pure, speak true, right wrong. I'm not interested in the phrases as slogans, but as descriptive of the life of the Lord laid out by him through his teaching and example. He said, after all, to hold up that we must hold up your light that it may shine unto the world. Behold, I am the light you shall hold up, that which you have seen me do. Behold, I am the light. I have set an example for you. So we speak of the pure life. Uh, what is it? Is it attainable, achievable, realistic? Is it a slogan, or is it, in fact, a mode of life invoked not only by a prophetic poet, but by prophets inspired of God? Talk about it a moment. Think about it a moment. One seeking to live a pure life will ask herself or himself, oh, what does God mean in my life? What is my real attitude toward Christ, life, myself, things, destiny? Is my purpose, my honest purpose, really to know and do the will of God? How much do I involve him and his son in my thinking, speaking, behavior? The pure life is ultimately, as we are taught, the only life worth living, and ultimately is realistic and attainable. In these marvelous records, the Lord declares that he will raise up to himself a pure people that will serve me in righteousness. A little earlier, recorded in that magnificent vision we now have in the 76th section, there is talk of great and marvelous works, mysteries of the kingdom, which the prophet and his companion were told not to write nor to utter, and then this, neither is man capable to make them known, for they are only to be seen, these great and marvelous works and the so-called mysteries, by the power of the Holy Spirit which God bestows on those who love him and purify themselves before him. Wonderful promises follow. Read a line from the third chapter of the book of Helaman where a group of people under intense pressures, pride and persecution being involved, made it in effect became something special in the midst of worldliness, pride, and persecution. How did they do that? They did fast and pray oft and did wax stronger and stronger in their humility and firmer and firmer in the faith of Christ unto the filling their souls with joy and consolation. Yea, even of the purifying and the sanctification of their hearts, which sanctification cometh because of their yielding their hearts unto God. Somehow they, through their own effort and God's blessing, uh, managed to get mature enough, mature in the pattern of the Savior and the Almighty. Uh, to yield their hearts. I don't think they became fanatical or hard to live with. They became cheerful and gracious and filled with a spirit. They became purer than they had been. They spoke the truth and they righted the wrongs 
done to them or that they themselves were guilty of. There are masterful and marvelous instructions. One I've loved best for years, and you may know as well as I, comes from the 24th Psalm, which in part reads, Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive, she shall receive the blessing of the Lord, righteousness from the God of his salvation. What a beautiful, sweet thing. What a lovely thing to have available and before us and in our minds and as an honest guide to our desires an expansion of that which is little and unbecoming and mean in us and a growth into that which can be light and sweetness and decency and good manners and grace and goodness. Live pure. I have a half dozen marvelous examples. Let me give you one. I interviewed a young man in a mission long ago who was somebody special. I'll leave out all the details except to say I knew he was and was told he was, and as I heard him, understood why. He hadn't always done very well. In fact, he had done very poorly in early high school years. He had picked up a lot of very bad habits. He had in a sense, muddied up his conscience and had departed far from the pure life. Then one night he and some of his friends in like condition somehow got in a ward dance because they had heard a new family lived in the ward and that there were some pretty girls in the family. Inside they spotted these three attractive girls and our boy was nominated by his giggling friends Uh, to go make the approach. He did, he asked her to dance, she agreed, and they began. He did something uh, which he reported to me in language I had not understood before. He made an immoral gesture, an invitation to her. She stopped on that floor, stepped back from him, and with hurt and anger said, why did you do that? He said, muttering, I guess to impress you, she said, you have, and left the floor. Uh, He uh, giggled with his friends who were laughing at him, left the floor himself, seemingly unperturbed. They went from the place, but he went home. They went wherever they wanted to go. And he sat on a bed, and then in front of a mirror took a look, and then for the first time made some approaches uh, to someone he hadn't really thought about for a while, and All of that worked together so that the next day after school, he knocked on her door. When she came, he apologized in sincerity. She said, do you hold the priesthood? He said, yes. She said, do you know what that means? Does it mean anything to you? He said it will. And from that hour, that moment of her facing him with a purity of conscience and a sense of propriety and of righteous indignation, from that moment of speaking the truth, he understood. Now he said, it took me a long time to get ready to come here. Even when I was asked, I wasn't really ready, though I'd spent a long time in preparation. But when I was ready, I told the bishop, I uh, haven't had any time to waste as a missionary, Brother Hanks, he said or any money, or any disposition. I am here for business, and if I have done any good, that's why. Live pure, speak true. Again, out of all these wonderful blessings I've had in recollection, let me just share a little about speaking true. There are a lot of ways to speak true, sometimes behavior, sometimes appearance, sometimes the disapproval of our 
spirit, sometimes in spoken word. I know a young lady and companions who worked among refugees, never able to teach a single discussion. But after a time, a man who had been very unsympathetic to any Mormon being in refugee camps because he thought we were not really interested in anything but aggressive proselyting, wrote a letter, a letter of apology and commendation. I want to read a sentence. According to this man, the girl reporting to me quotes him and tells me the story, there's still a great deal of fear among other voluntary agencies that the Mormons are here to proselyte. And he said, even if you don't ever talk about your religion, your values come across like a ton of bricks, and that frightens people. Perhaps one of his most clarifying comments was, you live what you believe, therein may lie your problem, especially when it brings such inner strength, peace, and confidence as you girls radiate. Speaking the truth, did you read last week's paper where a school teacher sent $200 back to the school district for, he said, the restitution of some small peculations. All he'd taken was some paper and some uh, paper clips and some elastics and small items over the years, probably didn't amount to many dollars. But now, years later, he sent $200 and pleaded for their forgiveness. Why did he do that? I read in the record where Christ confronted those who brought the woman taken in sin to get his approbation as they were going to stone her to death. The record says he knelt and wrote on the ground, then asked her where your accusers stood for a moment. They pressed the issue. He knelt again and wrote. And then it says, convicted by their conscience, they fled from the eldest to the youngest. Convicted by their conscience. Do you know why the school teacher sent in the $200? He sent it in because at this point in his life he looks back and is sick at heart that he was silly enough uh, to steal anything. Uh, that now it is vitally important to him that he have his own self-respect. He hasn't, you see, forgotten. The greatest deceit is to suppose you're going to forget. God will if we repent. Thank God but we ourselves go on remembering. And what about righting wrongs? I have to share with you as I finish. A letter re received from a marvelous human being you'd know and will know because her story, I'm told, is being written. I won't reveal the name. I'll simply tell you that I performed a wedding long years ago. Happy marriage, children, and then one day the announcement that he didn't want to be at home anymore. He had uh, a male friend he'd rather live with, and he went to do that, and for years did. He was invited home by this very unusual woman who taught her children that uh, he was part of them and that there were many virtuous and lovely things about him, that he had given them much. She could not justify the thing he'd done or the problem he had, neither could she understand it, but she could help them feel a sense of individual worth and value because there was so much in them that came from the good in him. He came home finally to die with AIDS and died in his own home among his own family. And then she wrote this, Dear Brother Hanks, I'm writing now because I want to let you know that last Thursday he passed away here at my home, a victim of AIDS. He had not been well for a year, but in March he was diagnosed with this disease. He made every effort to maintain his strength, but it was not possible. No one recovers. He wanted to be here with us, and I wanted him to be here. I read Walt Whitman to him and played Beethoven for him and told him how much we all loved him and did what I could to make him as comfortable as possible. Last night, the children and I and a few close friends held a private memorial service for him here was a wonderful event, and we are all able to release him with love. The children will miss him a great deal. I will, too. He gave a lot to all of us. Somewhere there is sense to this. I have been granted a great deal of strength to help me through it, and for that I am grateful. Then she compliments her loving bishop and stake president and 
friends and others who have supported and sustained. I go to sleep some nights and wake up some mornings thinking I read Walt Whitman to him and played Beethoven for him, and then I tell the Lord, the Lord, if before I die I can approach that kind of Christian quality, I will be grateful. Follow the Christ. Live pure. Speak true. Write wrong. These are uh, expressions of dreams and ambitions that are attainable and desirable and inevitable if one day we want to live the kind of creative, mature life our Father in heaven and his Son live. I bear testimony, they do, that I desire that as far as I am from it for me, and oh, how much I desire it for you and my children and their children, for therein lies happiness, ultimate joy, here and hereafter, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.